So this is how essentially rising interest rates are able to control inflation. Is the current debt situation a result of irresponsible spending? So typically when interest rates rise, your savings rate goes up plus your average consumption by the masses goes down. Lastly, how can an individual or how can a business mitigate the risk of rising interest rates? So I think broadly... Hi, I am Abhishek Ginodia. I am a chartered accountant and a chartered financial analyst. I've been into the equity markets and the wealth and the investment space for about 15 years now. I've handled close to 6,000 individual investors. But I run Altius Investec, which is an investment platform. It essentially allows people to invest into alternate assets, late stage private equity, high yield fixed income and fractionalized. Abhishek, what are interest rates? Why is it so concerning that US keeps raising interest rates and Canada is in such a problematic position because of interest rates? Everybody's head is just going round and round in circles. So let's expand on that. So I think broadly, the absolute basic tenet of economics is that to run any organization, you need capital, labor, and productivity. And capital has to come in multiple forms. Either it can come in the form of an equity or it can come in the form of debt. So debt is essentially when you are taking money from someone, promising a certain amount of money back after a certain period has elapsed. And the entire economy, from how much will you invest in an infrastructure project to what amount you will spend in terms of your daily expenses to what kind of a coffee will you drink when you are going to work. Everything depends upon the disposable income and everything essentially does boil down to the interest rate which is prevailing in these markets. This is one critical lever which any government has to sort of modify the entire country's financial behavior with one quick swipe. Why does the government get to control them? Broadly, how our banking system works is the central bank has been authorized by the government to essentially set a benchmark or a floor rate at which the other banks can borrow from the central bank. And the other citizens, corporations, LLCs are then required to borrow from these banks. So because the floor rate for a borrowing has been set by a central bank, therefore, all of the uh, downward movement of capital which happens from the central bank to the traditional banks and then to the capital allocators or the capital users essentially depends upon what the central bank's policy happens to. But then this raises another set of questions, right? The questions are, you know, the people we are putting in power, are they qualified enough to do this in the first place? And then the second question becomes, should the governments have the power to control the interest rate or should we just leave it to the free market? What, what are your thoughts on that? So I think in terms of the capabilities of the people who are running the show, in a sense, I think central banks across the world have done a really good job in controlling both inflation and ensuring currency stability and ensuring that the interest rates are also kept in check. We've seen nations wherein these control measures have not been put into place. And they've had rampant inflations, you know, like cases where, where we have heard, say, in Venezuela, wherein, uh, you know, you would require a probably cart full of currency notes to just buy a loaf of bread, right? And all of that has happened because the government has not been able to keep inflationary measures in check. So people kept on borrowing, people kept on buying new things. And at one point of time when the system was at a critical stage, the system actually just stopped working and the entire currency, the inflation, everything goes into a twirl. And that, that's how our economy collapses, essentially. Especially in the last decade, we have seen so many economies go through the exact same thing. I mean, off late, Sri Lanka has been an example where the exact same thing has gotten repeated. So I think central banks are a very, very crucial part of how a economy manages the financial sides of things. And while free market is good, there has to be some prevailing authority who sort of gives the free market a little bit of direction in when it is going absolutely haywire. Okay, let's let's take this deeper. When interest rates are high or when interest rates are lower, when they were lower, people were borrowing money and buying stuff, causing inflation to go high. Right? That's essentially the element of inflation that you're saying can be controlled by increasing interest rates. Should government prioritize the needs of the borrowers or those of the lenders when thinking about interest rates? Because the people borrowing are generally not the very wealthy in case they are borrowing from their future. Is government's current interest rate policy fair to all economic classes or does it disproportionately benefit the wealthy people? 
I think a central bank's interest rate policy is not geared towards either helping the people who are on the borrowing end or the people who are sort of supplying the capital. Their function is to keep the economy stable. They want to maintain a status quo as far as your inflation rates goes. So I think typically all central banks have two critical functions. One is keeping inflation in check and second ensuring that the currency fluctuations are not very wild. So whenever we have seen a central bank either reducing or in increasing rates, these are typically to keep these two things in check. Even if we take the very current scenario wherein, say, the Fed has been increasing interest rates meeting after meeting, that is broadly to bring the inflation rates back into check, which had shot up from 2.5% to 7% in the span of one and a half two years. Similarly, if you take the Indian economy, sometimes why the central bank does certain operations are so that one, inflation is in check and the second, currency depreciation or currency appreciation is also kept into account. Now, currency also can be both ways. So, if, it, if you're an exporting country, you would not want your currency to appreciate also because that makes your exports uh, weaker. So, you would actually want your currency to remain weak. For import-driven countries, they would want to ensure that their currency appreciates. So, that slowly and steadily, they, their currency has more buying power because they are a net importer of goods. Broadly, two levers or two final outcomes are currency and inflation. And it is not really linked to favoring one particular segment of the borrowers or the lenders. I think the kind of businesses in India that thrive are very capital intensive. There's a lot of manufacturing in India. Right? There's a lot of labor-driven businesses, again, very capital-heavy businesses. Lesser service economy, I think we are growing towards that, but far behind the West when it comes to just the number of service kind of companies that come through, like yours. Should the government prioritize the needs of the businesses or those of the consumers when they think about interest rates? Because an increased interest rate can really hit hard for businesses who are capital-intensive, who need consistent inflow of debt. It, it's their lifeblood cash is their lifeblood, right? So, what do you think on that? Let's look at a business dynamics, right? So, how I look at it for a economy, it's a zero-sum game, right? So, if the interest rates are high, then the person who's, or the corporation who's sort of investing into infrastructure, building out factories, they would start pricing their products higher so that they are able to get a larger margin. And that margin would essentially be absorbed in repaying the interest cost or the or repaying the debt amount right and typically because this in this higher pricing is getting passed on to the general public therefore it will impact the end wallet of the customer so if the economy is such that the inflation rates are already very low there's enough liquidity in the system the job rates are fairly healthy then it makes sense for the interest rates to be kept at a higher level because the, your economy is in a place where it can sort of absorb that higher interest rate and help your currency appreciate. But there's a contradiction, no? If the interest rates are higher, that means I am paying a higher rate on my debt. That means I have to price goods higher, which means inflation is higher. Yes. But on the other hand, when we say we are making interest rates higher, we are trying to combat inflation. So there's this confusion because... You are asking businesses to price stuff higher while you are asking consumers to consume stuff at a lower rate. What's happening? This is very confusing. Let's let's make it very, very simple. Sure. So I think typically what happens is, let's take a scenario where US was, say, in 2020. Right? So over that it, inflation was at about 2 to 2.5%. Interest rates were at 025 to 0.5% roughly. Now, typically at this stage, because there was no incentive for you to invest or keep money with the bank, what US citizens as a whole were doing was expending out whatever money they were making, either into buying assets or into simple lifestyle exp lead expenses. This slowly and steadily increased the overall consumption of the economy as a whole. Now, what happened suddenly was when the Ukraine crisis and the Ukraine-Russia war hit, it led to an increase in the energy costs. It led to an increase in the oil pricing. It led to a disruption of the entire supply chain. Even the food supply chain also took a massive hit and therefore there was an increase in the food pricing as well. That is when suddenly the demand stayed the same, but the supply suddenly reduced. And that is what caused the inflation. And therefore, when you see the inflation numbers, I think in 2021, that was somewhere around 25 
but in 2022 that inflation suddenly hit a 7% figure and that's that 3.5 to 7 is a, is a massive jump now what happens is when you increase the interest rate it promotes a, a average citizen to not spend out his entire money but to put something in the bank because he sees that he's getting a decent amount of interest there and then, he, then therefore he can use that as a higher amount later in life and because he has lower amount of disposable income because his borrowing costs have also gone up so say if you had a mortgage on a house your interest payments your average EMIs would have gone up therefore you would have lower disposable incomes with you you would also start reining in your expenses so typically when interest rates rise your savings rate goes up plus your average consumption by the masses goes down because the overall demand in the economy of goods goes down Therefore, the suppliers are now able to reduce the prices of the goods which they were earlier selling at a higher rate. So, this is how essentially rising interest rates are able to control inflation because they promote average citizens to reduce uh, consumption and increase savings. So, it's not just that the goods become lesser expensive or the goods become more expensive. It is that on both ends, there is something that is going up and something that is going down and you just have to check the balance of it. Absolutely. Talking about balance, right? Government plays two roles. One role is the short-term economic stability. The other role is the long-term growth of my economy. Governments are in power for around five years in India and four years in the US. The kind of debt that the government can take ranges anywhere from one day to 30 years. Should a government prioritize short-term economic stability or prioritize long-term economic growth when you talk about interest rates? Broadly, what has been seen is governments are typically looking at long-term stability. But sometimes in desperate situations wherein, say, a macroeconomic scenario has not left them in choice, say, during the 2008 financial crisis or very recently the COVID crisis, the unemployment rate has increased significantly the economy, economic activity has suddenly gone down. So if at those points of time, the government does not forego the long-term vision for a short-term measure, the economy will not get a jump start. Which is why during such periods, obviously you have to abandon the long-term thought and you have to reduce the interest rates, you have to give out money to people as a handout as well, so that they just start spending and the cycle of consumption again starts. Because if that cycle stays stopped for a longer time span, there is a very big chance of the economy going into a recession mode. And once that whirlwind starts, it is much more difficult for the government to get things back on track. So, which is why typically governments are long term, but because at times the needs of the, the need of the hour is somewhat so critical that they have to abandon the long term view and then, you know, take a little bit of a short term measure. Also to add to this point, I think, while governments have the final say, it is typically the central bank which takes the final call on interest rates, at least that, that's for major countries. And these are generally not very short-term measures, while they are obviously influenced by the ruling party or the ruling government in power. But typically, they have a slightly longer time term horizon because they are not getting going to get re-elected because of their policies. Their re-election will depend upon a host of other factors or a set procedure. So, central banks typically tend to have a longer time horizon or a longer alignment towards the longer well-being of the economy than, say, ruling party government. The US as a whole has more debt than they have yearly GDP. Even when I talk about India, India's debt as a country has been steadily rising and in fact has exponentially risen over the past 5-7 years or whatever the number may be. Is the current debt situation a result of irresponsible spending? Or is it necessary investments in the economy? In terms of spending, as long as the economy is be as long as the debt taken is financing infrastructure or capability building, till that point of time, it is justified to a certain extent because that investment will give you a return in the future that will ensure that your economy grows to a certain scale. And at that scale, servicing that debt and repaying that debt will not be a challenge. But... For, say, US, wherein the infrastructure is already at a matured stage and such reinvestments are typically not required in infrastructure spending, rather the deficit which is getting generated is because of, uh, you know, fiscal spending and not infrastructure spending, 
that is a space which technically is at least economically not the best place to be in can you make the words a little more clear can you talk about fiscal and infrastructure what do, what is the difference what is it so as simple as that if i am subsidizing petrol for my citizens that's a fiscal expenditure if i am borrowing money from external government to build a bridge in my country that's an infrastructure spending now infrastructure spending will make a little more sense because in that case that bridge is going to give me multifold value in the future in terms of increased productivity increased connectivity more business more vehicles but a subsidy given on a petrol to a citizen might not give me a future benefit that might something be a immediate consumption item typically if the majority of the spend is happening for infrastructure building there is a higher likelihood that the country as a whole will be able to pay back the amount and in fact service the debt as well but if i am simply borrowing a lot of money and i am subsidizing my daily activities then in that case i am not building out anything which allows me to sort of pay it off in the future or increases my ability to pay off the debt in the future infrastructure debt spending is still justified fiscal measures or just meeting your day to day expenses of running the government that's a place which is slightly critical and i don't know how how long that cycle can last i want to talk about investors i want to talk about how does rising interest rates affect me as an individual investor or affect me as a bigger company asset manager what should i be thinking how should i be thinking so i think from an investing lens i think typically one is you'll have to look at asset classes there's one very simple wealth management strategy which i heard from one of the largest wealth managers in india at least so he told me that when we look back at the last 10 years into what gave us the most returns it was not picking the right asset it was doing the correct asset allocation in the sense that it was not whether i picked out one of the 10 companies to invest into as an equity it was more whether i should have invested in that particular era in debt or in gold or into it so typically the first question for an asset manager is should you invest in debt or equity and typically debt connotes a lower return but capital protection significant capital protection and that assumption itself has been turned on its head in the last 2 years you know the exact what caused the failure of first republic and silicon valley bank was essentially they had bought out long dated us securities treasury securities which were for 10 years 15 years 20 years and because their interest rates had suddenly gone up from 0.25% to 4.5% in 2022 their 100 dollars of principal was suddenly worth 60 65 dollars and that's a scenario you just don't expect in a debt investment now if you are an equity investor even though your allocation thought is very clear that you want to invest into an equity asset class but simply because debt has become a much more rewarding asset class money can actually move from equities into debt very very suddenly and this essentially has been the entire reason behind the funding mentor so why did suddenly all of the capital dry up for uh, investing into startups which had been funding all of these lo- all of these loss making companies they were able to get higher and higher checks at increasing valuations throughout 2020 2021 it was broadly because you know your us treasuries were was yielding 0.25% so none of the pension funds none of the uh, retirement funds was essentially interested in keeping money in the bank or keeping money with the us government but when that number changes from a 0.25 to a 5% suddenly all of that maths changes right so all of them want a secured 5% bond with the us government instead of buying a 10 12% with a startup wherein i'll be tied up in illi- illiquidity for eternity and gains which may or may not come so as an asset manager or as an investor one obviously i have to observe and understand the interest cycles to understand whether i should be investing in debt if i am an investing in debt how long should the uh average tenure of the bond which i'm holding b so typically if i feel that you know 5 5 and a half is where the interest will top out there it makes sense for me to go for a longer tenure bond because that will give me a edge not only in terms of getting a higher interest payment but say if the interest rate rationalizes i might also make a capital gain on my debt investment in terms of equity 
obviously my opportunity cost equation will suddenly have a very big shift so i have to be much more congruent of the situation that there is a very healthy debt option available for me to allocate my funds rather than go into equity and even when i'm doing equity there might not be the same kind of demand and therefore while everything is the same while the company's growth rate is the same suddenly the pe ratios might decrease broadly from an investing lens asset class within asset class what tenure of product should i use in case of debt in case of equity should i do a re-rating of my portfolio in terms of the multiples which i have been giving them broadly because the money flow pattern has shifted I will one more thing that can be, that needs to be clarified for the investors you will only lose money in debt if you are going to sell it if you are going to hold on to debt and you're going to hold on to it till the extinction of its lifetime you are going to register all of the interest rates and you're going to get the principal back if it's a government security if it's a company security and the company goes bust then that's that's a you problem and <laughs> you always have to think of that Let's talk about an individual basis. Me as an individual who has nothing to do with investments, nothing to do with the government, nothing to do with the macro scale. I am a basic person looking for a job. How will an a rise in interest rate or a fall in interest rate affect my life? So I think typically, if we leave out the investing side of things, for average Joe, essentially the interest rate will impact inflation a lot, and inflation will impact your buying power. now because your buying power is shifting what amount of wage or salary a person will typically draw will also get a significant impact secondly because interest rate dictates the economic activity and as interest rates rises companies typically pull back infrastructure spending and expansion activities typically because they have to pay more for every penny which is spent in these activities the opportunities or the number of job creation and expansion activities goes down so for an average citizen there might be a slowdown in terms of the kind of access to opportunities that they have and on the other side in case of inflation because the interest rates are higher therefore the inflation might be higher and therefore your while you're earning the same amount of money your buying power may have reduced what about the job market does it change the job market dynamics at all Yeah absolutely so i think creation of new jobs is linked linked to companies making more investments creating more infrastructure expanding into newer divisions and all of that is linked to more and more capital being pumped as in when the interest rate rises so steeply and so fast typically all businesses might not be able to adjust to the new reality so quickly and that is where you know they they might suddenly abruptly stop hiring new people start firing people such has been the case which you've seen in the last one year i mean we was never heard of letting go of people and they you know did did mass layoffs in the last year and typically that is for the exact reason that all of the expansion plans which they had made they had to sort of put a stop to it because the cost of doing business had gone up so all moonshot projects essentially took a back seat and they said you know maybe we'll not do this for the next two years we'll look at it maybe a little later so we'll have to let a lot of people go yeah the banking scenario in canada is in tatters right now none of the banks are hiring they are mostly on hiring freezes nobody knows where the interest rates are going to go there is no clarity about the short term future let alone the long term future of things right so i feel like an individual gets affected a lot and more than they should be lastly how can an individual or how can a business mitigate the risk of rising interest rates so i think broadly for an indirect for both an individual and a, a organization for that matter it, they have to be fiscally prudent so saving a portion of whatever you're generating in terms of cash flow ensuring that you have enough saved off for a rainy day in case of job losses or in case you're not able to make the same kind of money going forward in terms of businesses ensuring that you have not over leveraged yourself with certain investments which you might not be able to keep if the money flow decreases ensuring that you have not over hired people uh, who you would have to let go if suddenly uh, you know money flow were to decrease ensuring that your debt to equity ratios are in a logical place where if there is sudden shoot up in the interest rate also your pnl will not take such a large hit that you essentially are not able to contain the blow so i think uh, tenets stay stay same for the individual and the company as a whole but obviously metrics change so it's more about being fiscally prudent